Today we have, today we have Coacher Bikar from Tsinghua and Cambridge, who will talk about moduli of algebraic varieties. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, let me uh, say thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, it's uh, nice to be here today, and probably some of my teachers are here, possibly. Okay, so I am going to talk about modular of algebraic variety. This is uh, algebraic geometry. So algebraic variety, they are the, the main objects in algebraic geometry. I will start with some very uh, general uh, general discussion of parameter spaces in mathematics. Uh, this is not just algebraic geometry, but in general. Uh, suppose that we have P is a collection of objects, mathematical object, but can be also non-mathematic. And M, we say is a parameter space for P. This means that the points of M parameterize the element of P, this collection of objects. This means in simple language that M is used to label the elements of P. And that means that for each element if in P, we have some a member in M which uh, names, we can use it as a label or as a name for that object in P. For example, if I take P to be a line and I take M to be the set of real numbers, uh, then uh, every point on the line can be parameterized by some real number. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence here. So this is, uh, in a sense, uh, one of the nicest possible situations that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence. But let's take another example. This time P is a circle and M is again the set of real numbers. We can think of P as the set of all the points X, Y in the plane over the real numbers such that x squared plus y squared is equal to one. And then we can define a map from M to P by sending T, T will be a real number to the sine of T and cosine of T. That will automatically belong to this circle and every point of the circle can be written in this way for some T. So we can think of this as the parameterization of the circle. And in fact, that is what people in uh, calculus in elementary calculus called parameterization, when you have some curve and then you parameterize it by the real numbers or by some interval. On the other hand, uh, let's take P to be the set of all the lines inside the plane which go through the origin. And this time I take M to be a circle. So we want to parameterize all these lines that go through the origin using the circle. Uh, what can we do here is do something like this. These orange lines are those lines that pass through the origin and we want to parameterize them. We can use the green circle here. Every orange line intersects this green circle in exactly two points. And we can use those two points each of those two points to parameterize or to, to label this line. So the circle then will give us a parameterization, not in a one-to-one -one way, but in a like two-to-one way to parameterize all these lines. Uh, this is a, a nice, a cute example, but it is important to algebraic geometry because we do something more general in every dimension, which looks like this, similar to this. Now, today I want to talk about parameter spaces in algebraic geometry. And this time we take collections of algebraic varieties and we want to parameterize this collection. 
Uh, first, remember that algebraic geometry is basically the study of geometric spaces that are defined by systems of polynomial equations over some field, for example, over the complex numbers. Now, if I take P, my collection to be all the lines inside C to the power N plus one that goes through the origin. This is similar to the previous example, but we are now working over the complex number field, not the real number field. Uh, but the setup is similar. Then I can use M to be this space, which is the N dimensional projective space. It's as a space, it is defined as the set of all the points with n plus one coordinates, where we have a zero to a n. All the AIs are uh, these are complex numbers, and at least one of them should be non-zero. So the points in this space, uh, their coordinates are not unique, not like the usual. Uh, spaces, affine spaces, here the coordinates are determined up to multiplying with a number. In other words, if I have a zero to a n, this gives me the same point as if I multiply every coordinate by one non-zero complex number. So the coordinates are not unique. They are determined up to multiplication by some non-zero number. Uh, in any case, this uh, gives you a well-defined space and it is called a projective space of dimension N and its points parameterize exactly all the lines that go through the origin in the N plus one dimensional space, which is the affine space, not the projective space. So the projective space is one of the, the main, it's, it's like the universe of algebraic geometry. It's where almost everything happens inside these projective spaces. Okay, let's now look at uh, a different kind of example. This time I work inside the two dimensional projective space P2, and I take the set of all the lines inside this two dimensional space. So in P2, there is no origin. There is no points like uh, in the affine spaces. So I take all the lines everywhere, not just those passing through some point. Now in the projective setting, every line is determined by a linear equation of the following form, ax plus by plus uh, cz, where x, y, and z, these are uh, coordinate variables on the projective space. Uh, although we are working inside the two-dimensional space, but because this is projective, we have three variables, not just two. So I look at all these lines. Everyone is given by a linear equation. And this line is determined by the coefficients of this equation, which, which are a, b, and c, but not in a unique way. If I multiply this equation by any non-zero number, I get the same line the line will not change, although the equation changes a little bit. So this means that the set of all these lines are parameterized by M, where M here is also a two-dimensional projective space, but a different copy. So we first look at P2 and all the lines there, and then we say that they are parameterized by a different universe, different P2, where the coefficients of these equations come from. So the nice thing about this example is that the parameter space itself is a projective space, not just a random set. Uh, we can look at some uh, more examples. If I look at now conics inside P2, conics are curves that are defined by degree two, um, like circles and ellipses and parabola, this kind of thing that we see in high school. Uh, but when you work over in the projective space, circles and ellipses, they are actually the same thing. They are not different. In algebraic geometry, they are the same object, they are isomorphic. Anyway, every conic is given by a degree two homogeneous equation of this form. So this you can take as the definition of a conic. 
And this equation now has six coefficients. In the degree one case, we had three coefficients, but now we have six coefficients and the equation, uh, the conic itself is determined by this equation, but up to multiplication by some non-zero number. If I multiply the equation by any non-zero complex number, the conic will not change, but the equation itself will change. So I can say that all these conics can be parameterized by uh, five dimensional projective space by the coefficients here, but up to this multiplication. So although I have six coefficients, but because of this multiplication process, then I have a five dimensional uh, projective space. So again, the parameter space here, uh, so you, you have uh, like a one-to-one -one correspondence here. Every coordinate is exactly given by some point in this projective space. And every point in this projective space gives you one coordinate. So again, it's one of those very nice situations. But there are different kinds of conics. You can have a smooth one, which look like a circle, but you can also have like a two lines intersecting. This is also a conic by our definition. But another possibility is to have a double line. Okay. To have a double line. Uh, was there a question? Uh, anyway, I didn't catch the question. So we also have the possibility of a double line. For example, if uh, B, C, D, E, and F, if they are all zero, but only A remains, then the equation is X squared. And in this case, this gives you a line, but with multiplicity two. So we call that a double line. Okay. And then a more general situation is the following, uh, where this time we work in an n-dimensional projective space uh, instead of two. In the previous example, we worked in P2, but now we work in Pn. And then our collection this time will be all the degree R, where the R is a fixed uh, positive number, natural number, degree R hypersurfaces. Uh, by definition, these are spaces inside Pn that are defined by non-zero degree D, degree R, but homogeneous polynomials inside this polynomial ring, which is C, T0 to Tn, but up to multiplication by non-zero complex numbers. So if you take any equation, any polynomial equation, in these variables, T0 to Tn, and if the degree of every term is exactly R, then this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree R, and that will give you, if you look at the set of solutions of this uh, in a good sense, in a proper sense, then you get a hypersurface inside Pn of degree R. And this time to parameterize these equations, we can do the same thing as before. Just look at the coefficients of these equations. All the coefficients will give you determined the equations so they can be parameterized by points in some projective space. And to determine the dimension of this projective space, you just need to know how many monomials you have of degree exactly R. Uh, for example, when n was two and r was two, in that case, we had six coefficients. But in general, you can calculate easily the, the number of monomials, and so you can calculate the dimension of this projective space. So in all these examples, the parameter space is the projective space. But in general, that is not the case. They are not always projective spaces. They can be much more complicated. Okay. Now to construct modular spaces in algebraic geometry, we have a notion of uh, bounded families, and this is uh, quite important for proving properties of modular uh, spaces, of parameter spaces. So suppose that P is a collection of 
uh, algebraic varieties, or it can be also a collection of schemes, more general. But for simplicity, I don't go into too much technicality. We say that this collection P is bounded if there is a morphism from Y to T of schemes that are of finite type. So usually that means we are working over some field, for example, the complex numbers, and such that every element X in our collection is isomorphic to some fiber of this morphism. So in other words, we have a big family where every object in P is among the fibers of this whole family. This is what boundedness means. You can also define it in, in other ways, but this is maybe the most simple way to define it. So in particular, this means if P is bounded, it means that this P is parameterized by some subset of T. That subset is the set of points in T where the fibers, so fiber here more or less means the inverse image of this point. The fibers, you look at all the points in T where the fibers belong to P and those parameterize P obviously. But uh, in general, we like to have some structure on this parameter space, not just as a set. And that's where moduli spaces come into the discussion. A moduli space M for our collection P is the parameter space that can give information about families of elements in P. So in very simple language, this means, uh, first of all, that this parameter space is not just a set. We want it to have some geometric structure on it. We want M itself to be like a variety or to be at least a scheme, a bit more general than a variety. In the example that we saw, we had projective spaces, but in general, they can be much more complicated. So that's one thing. We want M to have a geometric structure, but also if you have a family, some family, family usually means you have a vibration where the fibers belong to P. If you have a family of our objects, we want to have some information to be given by this moduli space. A bit more precisely, this uh, means, first, uh, we want to have like a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements, the objects in P and the points inside M, the points here in some appropriate sense. So we want to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's what uh, parameterization has been. So far, what I discussed, what I meant by parameterization was something like this, or a bit more general. But, but I want something more stronger than this, not just a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this is formulated in the following way. If I have any family X to S, where the fibers are all inside this P, then I want to have a moduli map from the base of the family from S to the moduli space M, where a point little s is taken to the point which corresponds to the fiber uh, over that point. So uh, you see that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the points of M and the objects of P. And now if I have um, a point on the base of this family, then the fiber I know that belongs to P. And so that corresponds to some point in M. And that will determine the map from S to the moduli space. And this map should not be just a set theoretic map, but it should be a map which is uh, algebraic geometry, means that it should be a morphism. Maps in the sense of algebraic geometry, which means basically they should be defined essentially by polynomials. So that's a, a rough uh, meaning of moduli space, although this is still not a precise definition. Okay, let's now look at some examples, uh, more important examples than those we have looked at so far. Uh, one of the most fundamental examples is, is this one. We first, we pick a polynomial phi, 
in just one variable with rational coefficients. And this is a numerical polynomial in the sense, if you put in a, an integer, it will give you an integer. Now let's look at Pn. We fix our projective space Pn and then every closed subscheme, or you can think of just some solution of some system of polynomials, for any such x, we have a so-called Hilbert polynomial phi x, which is defined uh, using cohomology. Now unmuted. Uh, this is defined using uh, cohomology, uh, but I think better not going to too much into, into the details. So for every such x, you can assign a polynomial, uh, which is similar to this phi that we fixed in the beginning, but they could be different. Now I take my P to be the set of all the closed subschemes X inside PM such that the Hilbert polynomial of X is exactly this phi, this fixed phi. Uh, so for example, in the case of, uh, if I take hypersurfaces, those that are defined just by one equation, this more or less means fixing the degree of that hypersurface. Uh, but if you have more polynomials involved, um, then this will be a bit more complicated, but still you can define this phi and then say we fix the Hilbert polynomial. This is the set of all our objects. And then a fundamental result of Grothendieck says that there is a moduli space for this collection in the nicest possible way. First of all, there is a projective scheme H uh, this means some subspace of some other projective space, such that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between our objects in P and the uh, set of all the points in this uh, H, this scheme. So usually it means, uh, if you be a bit more precise, you need to look at the points defined over the the complex number or the ground field, not all the arbitrary points. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence and then there is a so-called universal family over this Hilbert scheme. And that means the following. It means that if I have any other space and this scheme S and if I have, basically if I have any family over some space S. Here you, you need to make it precise what you mean by family. And this is how it is defined. In this case, you look at the product of Pn with S, and then you look at uh, closed sub schemes, which are flat over the base, and so that the fibers have exactly the same Hilbert polynomial as phi. But roughly speaking, this just means uh, a family, a vibration where the fibers belong to this collection P. So if you have any such family, uh, then there is a map from the base of the family S to the Hilbert scheme, to this projective scheme H, such that our family over S is just a pullback of the universal family by this map. So this is saying essentially that there is a, a big, very big family over some scheme H over some space, such that any family that you construct out of this P, it is always coming from this big family. There is nothing new. Everything can be derived from this universal family. But in general, this is not the case. So, so this is a very special uh, situation, but still quite general. And this H is called the Hilbert scheme or the moduli space of this collection P and is called a fine moduli space because of this universal family here. Uh, so these are the nicest kind of moduli spaces, but most moduli spaces in algebra geometry are not fine. They are not as nice as this one. Um, and this example is quite important also because uh, most other moduli spaces are constructed using this example.
Okay. Now let me look at some other examples. Um, so, so far we worked with some special sub varieties or subspaces of the projective space. So we fixed the projective space and then we looked at some subsets, but now we can do things a bit more abstract. Um, we can work in dimension one. Algebraic varieties in dimension one, they are called curves. And let's just look at smooth curves for the moment. Uh, smooth curves uh, over the complex numbers, they are just a compact Riemann surface with the projective one. And for such curves, there is a nine variant. There is a number attached to them, which is called the genus of this curve. And this is the most important number that you can attach to a curve. This kind of numbers can be read from the topology of this curve. So if we, let's say, work over the complex numbers, uh, then uh, curves are one dimensional over the complex numbers. But when you look at them as manifold over the real numbers, they become two dimensional. So they are surfaces, not curves. It depends how you look at them. And the shape of this kind of curves or surfaces, they just look like this as in this picture where you can have any number of poles. Uh, you can either have no hole at all. In this case, you just have a ball. And this is called a Riemann sphere. It's just a sphere. And the genus is zero because there is no hole. Or you can have genus one where there is one hole. And what you have is just like a tube, like a donut. But you can have genus two, three, or any positive natural number. You can construct examples of any number of poles. So the genus then basically is a topological invariant. It just depends on the topology of the surface, not really on the algebraic geometric structure. But for the genus zero case, there is only one curve that gives you this sphere. But for genus one, for example, there are infinitely many different curves. They topologically all look the same but geometrically they are not the same, they are different. And these are el called elliptic curves. Anyway, so for dimension one, genus is the most important thing that you can look. So now let's fix a number G, a non-negative integer, and then we look at curves with this fixed genus. So our collection this time will be all the smooth projective curves, of genus exactly G. And we look at them up to isomorphism. That means if two cur curves are isomorphic, we count them as one. Uh, this is different from what we did before. In the examples before, for example, when I tried to parameterize all the lines inside some projective space, these lines are in, a, in an abstract sense, they are actually isomorphic. They are the same space but they sit in different places inside the projective space. So we count them as different things. But here we are doing something a bit different. Here, if we have two lines, then we count them as just the same thing. They are not, they are not different. So we are looking in a different way. We are parameterizing things in a different way. So it, it is important to see, to know what, uh, how you formulate your problem. Anyway, in a long time ago, in the 19th century, Riemann showed that there is a moduli space MG for this collection PG. So what he showed is basically that there is an algebraic variety. In this case, MG will be just a variety, not a, a scheme, such that the points of this variety are in one-to-one -one correspondence with this PG here. So every point exactly corresponds to one curve of genus G. As an example, if we take um, zero, genus zero, then M zero is just one point because there is only one curve of genus zero, which is just P one. And that is the, the sphere, the Riemann sphere is the only curve of genus zero 
So in this case, this space is only one point. But if I look at genus one, then there are infinitely many curves of genus one. There are many more than genus zero. And in this case, M1 happens to be just A1. And A1 means the one dimensional affine space, which you can think of as simply the complex numbers, just a set of complex numbers. They parameterize all the elliptic curves. So for every elliptic curve, you have exactly one complex number, and that number determines precisely that elliptic curve. And these are called, this number is called the J invariant. So that will give you the one to one correspondence. But if you increase the genus, then there will be more curves, so we'll, you will get a larger space, and so on. But here, another important aspect of modular spaces in, in mathematics in general is about compactness. So these modular spaces of Riemann, they are not compact, except in, in genus zero case, which is trivial. But in genus one and more, the spaces are just some varieties, but they are not compact varieties. We like to have a compact moduli space because then you can study it much better than a non-compact one. And more or less like 100 years after Riemann, Delin and Manford, they show that if the genus is at least two, then you can compactify this moduli space in a meaningful way. You can always compactify if you just not care about anything. You can just, so this MG is the variety inside, it sits inside some projective space. You can just compactify it in an arbitrary way, but that's not what we want because that just doesn't mean anything. Uh, this result of Delin and Manford say that you can do this compactification in a meaningful way, meaning, and this means that the point that you add, they also, parameterize some objects, some geometric spaces. In fact, they parameterize the so-called stable curves. And a stable curve is something like following. If I, again, fix the genus G, then a stable curve of genus G, uh, this is a connected projective curve X, where it may have singularities, but the singularities will be of the nicest possible kind. These are called nodal singularities. The genus is again G. This can be formulated uh, not topologically, but in a cohomological sense. And also finally, the canonical bundle of this curve is ample. You can uh, interpret this in a different way. Uh, by looking at the normalization of this curve, you can remove the singularities and then there will be some basically combinatorial conditions to tell you that you have some positivity, which means that this K is ample. Um, I think the best is just to look at some examples. If I have a smooth curve, smooth projective curve of genus at least two, that is a stable curve just by definition. There is no singularity, so we don't have to worry about these conditions. But you can have, for example, two curves, both of genus at least one, and they intersect in one point, like in this example. Or you could have other examples where some curve maybe intersect itself and also intersect other curves. So basically a stable curve is then a union of some curves where the singularity, the intersections are nice. And then you also have some positivity conditions here, which is given by this canonical bundle. Uh, so if we work in, in genus two, for example, uh, then the examples would be like a smooth curve of genus two, or you can also have uh, this genus one, genus one intersecting at one point and, and so on. So what the linear Manco show that if you also consider these singular stable curves, then the moduli space that you get is a compact moduli space. It's larger than Riemann's moduli space, but the points that you add to make it compact, 
they also mean something. They have some meaning in algebraic geometry. Uh, but anyway, these uh, modular spaces, both MG and also the compactification, they are uh, so-called coarse modular spaces. They are not fine, like in the Hilbert scheme example, in the sense that there is no universal family, but still you have uh, very nice modular properties. Okay, that's the story in dimension one. Um, Maybe here we can, I can just pause a little and see if there are some questions. Uh, so in the chat, it seems there is no question in the chat. Is there any question? Um, okay, if there is no question, I can continue. Um, okay, so the story so far is kind of old. Uh, what I said was in about 19th century Riemann and then some result of Grothendieck in the 50s, 60s, and then Deline Mumford a bit after that. So these are like 50, 60 years old uh, stuff, but now I want to discuss more recent results and this have to do with higher dimension. By higher dimension, I mean, you look at collections of algebraic varieties of dimension two or more, and then you ask the question, what classes have modular spaces? If you pick an arbitrary collection of varieties, you can be more or less sure that they will not have a modular space. Uh, so you need some strong properties. And that's what I want to discuss here. What kind of conditions we should put to ensure that there is a modular space? Well, experience over the last two centuries shows that you must have some strong geometry properties. Sorry, Coach. There's a question yeah. at box. Maybe you can see it. Uh, OK. Question, whenever you compactify a modular space, what are the nature of the points you add in the compactification process relative to the usual points of the modular space? Uh, yeah, so this uh, more is, I don't know, it's not quite a question, but maybe like a remark. Um, it depends on the situation. It depends on the objects that you compactify. If you have a collection, you have a modular space, and then you decide to compactify it, then how to compactify it depends on this modular space. So one method that works in one scenario may not work in another scenario. There are different techniques for compactifying modular spaces. Um, so today I'm going to talk about one of these techniques that has been quite successful in recent years, uh, but there are other techniques also uh, that you can, uh, sometimes people compactify spaces, they actually don't have meaning. Uh, it's just that uh, the compactification itself looks nice. For example, there are like toroidal compactification and so on. Although there may, you may not have a meaning for the points you add, but at least you say, well, the compactification looks nice. For example, it has nice singularities. Um, but in today's story, we really want to add points to the space with some meaning. So there is no universal answer to the question. It just depends what kind of objects collection you are working with. But for modular of algebraic varieties, uh, today I'm talking about a technique that has been quite uh, working quite well. Okay, so suppose that W is a smooth projective variety, then standard conjectures in birational geometry. So this is essentially the field that I work. I have done most of my work. These conjectures imply that we have the following picture. That if I start with any W, which is smooth and projective, then there is a transformation and this is usually called MMP or the minimum model program. It transferred, transformed this W into another space X. 
which may have some singularities, but these singularities are not too bad. So we get some X together with some map to some other space Z where this, there are two possibilities. Either this X that we get is a so-called a good minimal model. And this means uh, that the canonical bundle of this K uh, of this X is a semi ample. It means that uh, there is this map X to Z where this K is essentially the pullback of some positive uh, like bundle, positive or ample divisor on the base. Um, so this canonical bundle itself, this is defined in terms of a differential forms. So canonical bundle is basically a differential geometric object. Uh, you can derive this, for example, from the sheaf of differential forms, or you can also define it using tangent spaces and so on. So this is one case where you have some positivity, but there is another case which is quite different. And here you have negativity, a so-called more refined of vibration where along the fibers, your canonical bundle will be negative. So either you get some negativity or you have like non-negativity. There are these two cases and uh, to prove that there is such a thing is extremely difficult. People have tried for 40, 50 years, and we can do some of many things, but not in full generality. So this is a very strong statement that you can start with something arbitrary and turn it into something which has some very nice structure. Okay, and then, here, I want to first focus on the moduli of uh, stable varieties of general type. I will explain what general type means. So until quite recently, until the last six, seven years, moduli theory was basically limited to dimension two and some very special cases in higher dimension. In the dimension three and four and so on, there wasn't really much known. And, but it is now more or less uh, complete. It is basically complete in every dimension when you look at variety of the general type. And what this means, let's fix a natural number D and a positive number, rational number V. D will be dimension, V will be a volume. I explain a little, a little bit what this means. Let's look at the class, the collection of all the varieties the so-called stable varieties of general type. These are projective varieties X. They are a fixed dimension D. So it's natural in module, I always fix the dimension. It is quite natural. The singularities are nice in a technical sense. They are low canonical, but uh, if you are not familiar with these things, we just better ignore. So there are some reasonable singularities. The canonical bundle of this X is ample, is positive in a very strong sense. And the volume of this bundle is exactly V. And the volume can be defined in different ways. The easiest way is to look at the top intersection number in the sense of intersection theory, and that gives you the value. Uh, you can also define it in the sense of uh, looking at all the multiples of K, how many sections they have and so on. But this is, I think, the easiest way. Uh, in dimension one, for example, this just means the degree of this K is fixed. But in higher dimension, we have the volume instead of, uh, of the degree. So this volume basically replaces the genus in dimension one, we looked at genus. That was the main iron variant. In higher dimension is the volume, not the genus. Okay, so we have all these varieties, fixed dimension and fixed volume. And this is a very large class. It's not so small, but still it, it is uh, not extremely big. Still it is manageable. Uh, here there are some examples which I will just skip. 
Now, um, an important result about 10 years ago of Haken McKenna to say that this class that I just defined is a bounded class. This means that it can be parameterized by some space, some scheme which has finite time. But this is just a parameterization statement. It's not a modular statement. And then work of many people in the last 40 years, in particular, Kolar, Alexia, Vivek, and many other people, if you put all this work together, then it shows that this class has a moduli space. And moreover, we can compactify this moduli space in a meaningful way, similar to the case of curves. In the case of curves, we added some singular curves which are stable. In higher dimension, you can also define stable varieties that are in some sense similar to stable curves, but of course much more complicated. And if you take all of them at the same time with fixed dimension and fixed volume, this gives you a compact moduli space. So general, general type here just essentially means this positivity here that the K is ample. Uh, but this is not the only K, there are many other varieties which, for which K is not ample. Okay, and another case is, uh, so maybe I go back to, to this statement here, into this picture, I say that if we start with any W, then we get this picture here from X to Z. Uh, so um, let's just ignore the final case. And if we look at the minimal model case, then there are many possibilities. Here, you could have X and Z, X to Z could be just uh, an isomorphism. That's basically the general type case. But there are other cases. For example, uh, let's say we are in dimension uh, two. Then one possibility is that X to Z is just an isomorphism. Another possibility is that X to Z is a vibration where the fibers are curves and the base is also a curve. And still another possibility is that X to Z is a constant map where Z is a point. So depending on what the dimension of Z is, you get different cases. And if the dimension, if we work in dimension D, then there will be like um, D plus one cases, depending on what the dimension of Z is. The dimension of Z can be zero, one, two, and up to D. So you have D plus different classes of varieties, and then we like to look at their moduli spaces. Um, the case when dimension of Z and X are the same, this is the general type case. But so this is one of the extreme cases. Another extreme case is when Z is the point, if dimension is zero. And that's what I want to look at next. And this in that situation when Z is a point, what you get is called a collabial variety. Um, so Calabia varieties in general, uh, they basically uh, mean that their canonical bundle is trivial in a sense. It is in a numerical sense, it's completely trivial. But on this kind of varieties, there is no natural ample divider. There is no natural positivity. So we need to add some positivity to construct moduli spaces. So what we do here, again, we fix a natural number D and fix a positive rational number V. So the data is similar to what we had before. But now I consider a very different class. I look at stable Calabria varieties. This means I look at all the X and A, where X is a projective variety of dimension D. These singularities are, again, reasonable. The canonical bundle is trivial in a numerical sense. It's trivial, but instead I have A, which is an ample divisor, effective ample divisor. And so the positivity comes from here. 
And the volume of this ample divisor is fixed, which is V. And also something about singularities, which we better ignore. So in this case, then we have a Calabia together with some polarization where the volume of this polarization is fixed. For example, we can, in dimension one, we could look at uh, X. In this case, X will be an elliptic curve. They will have genus one. And then we could take A to be just one point. Or you could take A to be a uh, two point or a collection of points, depending on what V is. The A will be just some linear combination of points. Or if you could work on a K3 surface and take A to be any ample and effective uh, device, or you can look at uh, work on abelian varieties. Uh, in this case, in the case of abelian varieties, moduli spaces were contracted uh, earlier. And but these are all examples of this more general setting. Um, in fact, Mumford and other people and Alexiev and so on, they show that there is a moduli space for, in the case of abelian varieties, where this ample divisor is a very special one, which are called principally polarized abelian varieties. Okay, so now I'm interested more in the general statement about this class. And this was proved by myself just a couple of years ago, which says, First of all, this class is a bounded class, meaning that this collection can be parameterized by some finite type space. And moreover, there is a moduli space for this class, and this moduli space can be compactified in a meaningful way. This is similar to the general type case, but the classes are very different. They are not the same thing. One is about general type, another one is about Calabiales. Okay, and then you could ask, uh, what about other cases? Uh, remember that picture we had X to Z. Uh, so far, I just looked at the case when dimension of Z is maximal and the case when dimension of Z is minimal. But what about in between? You could have many cases depending on the dimension. Uh, what can we do? Uh, okay, so there is a question. Is the Calabia variety the same as n-dimensional Kähler manifold? No, not, not every Kähler manifold is a Calabia, but you can also look at uh, Calabia from a differential geometric point of view. Uh, so they are not the same thing. In the case of a billion varieties, is your compactification the same as the one given by Mumford and Alexiev? Um, it's not the same as the one given by Mumford. He used his toroidal compactification and so on. Uh, but it should be more or less the same as the one, should be the one given by Alexiev because he used also similar constructions. So it's similar to Alexiev. Okay, and so I just want to spend a few minutes and talk about what we get in between. Uh, in this case, there is almost nothing in the literature. There is There are just some very special cases in dimension two. Um, but uh, we can define what a stable minimum model is. So this covers all the cases so far. Uh, in this case, I have X is some variety, A is some uh, effective divisor. Uh, the X itself will be a good minimal model. Essentially, this means its canonical bundle is uh, semi ample, means that pullback of ample by some map X to Z. A is, as I said, an effective divisor, but it is ample only over Z, not globally. And something about singularities, let's just ignore this. So, those are stable minimal models. And if I, let's say we work in dimension three, let's see what we get. If we look at stable minimal models of dimension three, one possibility is if A is equal to zero, in this case, X is just a stable variety of a general type. 
is in the first class that we discussed. But if X is the Calabiao, so this means the dimension of Z is zero, then this is just a stable Calabiao as I defined a few minutes ago. But there are other cases. We can have X to Z an elliptic vibration where the base Z will be a surface and then this A will be ample over Z. For example, this A could be like a section of this vibration. But another possibility is when Z has dimension one, in that case, X to Z is the vibration where the fibers, most of them are like K3 surfaces or abelian surfaces or similar things. So in dimension three, then there are these four, basically quite different classes that we can get. And what I want to say is that in each case, we can construct moduli spaces. Uh, but this time, because the situation is more com complicated, we need to put in more data than before. Before we just fixed a D and V, but now we also need a polynomial. Otherwise you just don't get the kind of moduli space uh, we are interested in. So this time now we consider, uh, we fix this data D, V and a polynomial in one variable. We look at the class of all the, stable minimal models xa where the dimension is fixed as before they are stable by the definition that i gave and then the the so-called eta volume of the canonical bundle is v so this means uh, k kx is a pullback of something ample on the base z and the volume of that thing on the base is v so that's the definition and then finally, if I look at this divide, the kx plus ta, where the t is very small, uh, then this is ample by definition. So I can talk about the volume of this. And this volume, I want it to be given by this fixed polynomial sigma. So in the case of Calabia and general type, you don't need this polynomial because it's just determined by d and v automatically. But in other cases is not automatically determined. So you need to put in this extra data. And so one of the latest things that I haven't published yet, but this is what I proved is that this collection given by this data DV and Sigma is bounded. And also there is a modular space for this class and it can be compactified in a meaningful way. So this is the main uh, result in this direction, but um, it is actually proved. I mean, so far, almost everything I said, they are discussed and proved in the setting of pairs, which is much more general and more interesting because you get more examples of modularized spaces. Uh, okay. And uh, this whole thing relies on, on many work. It relies, first of all, on this theory of moduli for general type, which was developed by Kohler, Alex Tierp, and other people. But it also relies on many of the work that I have done in the last six, seven years. Um, so the main point essentially is to show that these classes are bounded. Once you know that they are bounded, then the rest is, is kind of more or less um, you know what to do. There are, of course, technicalities, but you at least know how to pro proceed. So the main thing is, is to show that they can be parameterized by some finite type spaces. And this relies on many dif different work that I have done recently. Okay, I think I stop right here. And thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. So uh, I can there see a question. One, one question in the chat. Uh, I say, um, thank you for your nice talk. Well, thank you also. Uh, I have a general question. How does the structure of a moduli space reflect on the members of the family with parent writers? Uh, yeah, of course, this is uh, a good question. So first, 
we constructed moduli spaces. This is more like the first step. And then the next step will be to study these moduli spaces in detail, to study their property. And their properties are usually coming, these properties come from the properties of the collection itself. For example, what kind of singularities you can have on these moduli spaces. Uh, and so on, this just reflects, of course, the properties of the, the members of the family. So for example, the more general families you, you, you start with, the more general bigger collections, then you get more and more complicated moduli spaces. Uh, so for example, if all the members of the class are smooth, then that will say something about the moduli space. But if you consider singular one, then that will translate into something about the moduli space. So uh, this is also related to deformation theory. For example, you can fix one of your, the members of your family and then say, uh, can it deform to any other member in the family? And then here you can make it precise what deform means and so on. And that will reflect local properties of the moduli space. Uh, so yes, there is a strong connection, but it's not so easy to study the spaces. So that will be like the next uh, step. Okay, uh, there is another question. Thank you for your great uh, talk. Uh, thank you to you too. Is there a parameterization for the space of locally isomorphic maps between two of these spaces or among all of them? Spaces of locally isomorphic um, maps. So, uh, for what spaces? You mean between the moduli spaces, or or are you fixing some varieties? I want to suggest them to unmute themselves, and then can the question directly, yeah, suggest. Yes, yes, you can just ask the question. Uh, between two fixed varieties. Yeah, if you fix uh, if you fix two varieties, then you can also look at um, a space of all the maps. This can be embedded into some uh, like moduli space, for example, into some Hilbert scheme. Uh, so one of the uh, examples that I know that is, is important is if you have, for example, a curve. You fix a curve and then you fix uh, an algebraic variety and you look at all the maps from this curve to that variety. And then you look at the space of all these maps and that has very important uh, applications, for example. So we, yes, in general, you can uh, view because um, when you have a map from a space to another space, um, for example, you could look at the graph of this map and then um, associate so consider this graph itself and then try to parameterize these graphs and so on. So it, it, they are related, yes. Can I also ask a question? Yes, yes sure. So thank you very much for your talk. Uh, can you uh, give a little more details about the compactifications? So you mentioned meaningful compactifications for all these cases you have, but can you say a few words about the compactifications? So what are the boundaries? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is similar to the case of dimension one, where we added this uh, stable uh, curves. So fortunately, I have one last page, which actually is related to what you ask, limits of these varieties. So we, if we just look at varieties, then I already defined this thing. And then the question is, what are the limits? What we have to add? And this is what I discuss in this page here. Uh, we can define spaces that are similar to stable curves. Stable curves, they, they can have different components, but they intersect in a nice way. And you can define this also in higher dimension. And its uh, definition is, is like this. It's more, more technical. Uh, what we get, these are called semi canonical varieties. And if you want the precise definition is, is like this. They are reduced pure dimensional quasi, let's say, projective spaces, uh, projective schemes. 
that they satisfy the following conditions. Um, they satisfy S2, S2 here is the so-called SIR condition two. And so it's satisfied this condition everywhere, but in co-dimension one, the singularities are nodal. Nodal is, is just like two planes, like two curves that intersect transversally, or in, in any dimension you can formulate something similar. It's like two planes inside some projective space intersecting each other. They intersect in a nice as possible way. So we want to have co-dimension one singularities of this type, but higher co-dimension singularities can be much more complicated. Uh, the canonical bundle is Q Cartier, meaning some multiply the Cartier divisor. And finally, if you normalize this scheme X, so this will separate into several components usually. And then uh, there is a so-called conductor of this normalization, which is given by this one uh, co-dimension one singularities. And then on the normalization, you get um, not only of the, the variety, but together with this conductor, uh, that become a pair. And if the singularities are nice in the sense of being low canonical, then this is what you get as semi low canonical variety. And also, if you assume that the canonical bundle is ample, then you get a stable variety. So the limits will be of these four. Right, thank you very much. So, Harry, can you unmute yourself? Yes, um, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for your nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, modulatory of uh, stable pairs. I think in uh, your paper you uh, prove um, the existence of a modular space for only uh, polarized uh, Calabio varieties and uh, polarized Fano pairs. Uh, is there any new result about uh, other varieties? Uh, well, the new result is basically this what I said uh, here, this late, the last result, uh, that there is a modulus for these classes. So here I look at all these stable, you can take pairs also, it doesn't have to be just a variety, it's working yes. the same way. If we look at all the stable minimum models and they are polarized by these effective divisors, then there is a moduli space in general. So this is the latest result that I know about moduli in general. Okay. And it can you say something about the dimension of moduli space? Yeah, that is another question then, or how to calculate the dimension of the spaces. I, I don't really know at this moment because I just didn't um, study the spaces themselves. So far, I my main concern was to show that these modular spaces exist and that they can be compactified and so on. And then of course, next we would uh, like ideally to learn more about these modular spaces. For example, what are the dimension? What are the singularities? Uh, what are the geometry? For example, um, the Kodara dimension and so on, the birational structure. Uh, there are many things that one can uh, study here, uh, especially in the case of pairs, because in that case, there will be also coefficients involved in the, in the boundary divisor. And then you can ask, if you change these coefficients, how the modular space changes? And that will also lead to some uh, very interesting questions. So there are many things, but I haven't really studied these things uh, so far. And this, this result itself is very new. Uh, as I said, it's not even published yet. OK, thank you very much. May I ask another question? Yes, sure. Uh, uh, is there a family for which uh, no parameter space or moduli space could be assigned? Uh, yes, I think there are many. Uh, in general, as a, as a rule, I think if you 
Well, first, it depends how you formulate the question. What uh, do you mean by uh, having a modular space? Because if you discuss modular space, first you need to say what is your collection. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is what are the families that you allow? I mean, the courses, the worst, worst moduli space, for example. Uh, for then, uh, well, it's a, not really. I mean, there is why they should be, first of all, they are not, in general, if you take any arbitrary class, they are not bounded. So that's one already one issue there. They cannot be parameterized by any finite type space. So there are many examples already in dimension two, for example, there are a, a lot of collection of surfaces. For example, you can look at uh, singular far surfaces. If you look at smooth ones, then uh, they are bounded and so on. Uh, but if you look at the singular one, then they are not bounded anymore. So that's one thing. If you like to have like finite type and projective modular spaces, that's already one thing. You need to deal with this uh, issue of boundedness. So there are many examples that they are not bounded. And then the other issue uh, is about, uh, for example, there are many things that are not separated. So I have to be a bit more technical here. If you want to have uh, like a projective moduli space, then by definition, a projective moduli space is separated. So yeah, if you, if you translate that into um, families, essentially that means that uh, if you have a family given over some, um, let's say you have a family over, over the complex numbers, but with, uh, with one point removed. Mm -hmm. yes. And then you can ask the question, can you extend this family in a, well, you can ask, can you extend it? That's one question. This is about basically properness and projectivity. But another question is, is it possible that you have two different ways to extend the same family? And in general, yes, especially this happens with um, for example, if you look at like fun of variety, this is very commonly happens that it, the, the, the family can be extended in different ways. And that means uh, that this moduli problem is not a separated one. And that already means that you cannot have a projective moduli space for this kind of family, for this kind of collections, because it doesn't satisfy this exactly. separated. Um, question. And then there are other cases where you may not have, uh, you may not be sure that there is a compactification at all. So uh, it depends on the, the classes that you look. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. You're welcome. So Javad just told me that he got, a, he had a technical problem and he got disconnected. He's trying to join us again. So I'm taking over from here. So uh, I think Masoud Ganji has a question. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it, uh, and, but I didn't get too much. But I had uh, just two, two general questions. First of all, I'm more interested in any relation between what you are doing and comp or in between this and also complex or CR geometry. If there is any relation between these, these two, actually, I'm more interested in that. Uh, if you can give us some some the advice, complex, uh, what what kind of geometry complex? So a Kähler geometry, Sasaki geometry, or uh, yeah, because this uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds actually or varieties actually ring a bell that there there might be a relation between these two this between these two geometries. If you have any yeah, idea, or um, any there are connections. So, for example, uh, one problem in in Kähler geometry, that if you have a if you have a Kähler manifold, is there some kind of metric with a very strong property? These are called usually Kähler Einstein. Metrics. Kähler Einstein, yes, of course, of course. Yes. Uh, so in the case of Calabi's and the case of uh, general type, uh, they 
this matrix exists. So they were proved by Yao and, and other people. Yes. Yeah. But, but in the case of Fano varieties, they don't always exist. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there was a question for uh, a long time, when such metrics exist, can you formulate it in terms of uh, some algebraic geometric properties? And over a long time, people uh, figured out that there, in fact, there is, uh, there is some algebraic geometric condition. And finally, it was proved by Donaldson and uh, some of his uh, collaborators. So, uh, so by they, metric you mean sorry, but by metric you mean a Riemannian metric on a, on funnel varieties? Yeah, the, the, there is a, a metric. So you have a metric. It it it's a Keller Einstein metric. Of course, yes, yes, yeah. And yeah. then this, uh, yeah, the question is, do you have such a metric on a funnel variety or, or not? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, in general, is no. No, in general, no. Uh, in, but in the question was, uh, can you characterize, can you maybe formulate this in a different way? Yeah, yeah. That whether they exist or not. Uh, and then finally, it was proved by some, it's not easy to state what, what the properties are, but you can formulate it in a purely algebraic geometric way. Mm -hmm. And then it is also related to this uh, modular discussion because uh, one of the reasons that people are interested in this uh, story is that you you like to, for example, construct a moduli space for final varieties. If mm -hmm. you consider final varieties in general, then uh, this is usually a complicated uh, a problem. As I try to explain, in general, moduli spaces don't exist unless you have a good right formulation of the moduli problem. And one of the possible formulations is to look at only at those funnels which have the scalar Einstein metric. Mm -hmm. And then uh, people show that in that case, that there is a modular space, that they behave well. Some of these issues like the separatedness that I discussed, that they disappear in this situation. That's very really interesting. That's very really interesting. And the second question was, uh, in, in your talk, you always refer to, to, to the work by, by Kolash. Do you mean uh, Martin Kolash from Masalik University, or are you referring to somebody um, else? No, I was talking about Kolar, Janos Kolar. He is at, at Princeton. All right, all right, sir. Thank you very much for that. Co <laughs> uh, chair, uh, sorry, there was a problem at the University of Isfahan, and Javad is disconnected. No, no, now I'm connected. Sorry. Oh, you are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. You, you came back. You're back. You're back. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so, for the case of MG or AG, uh, if G is large enough, if the genus is large enough, they turn out to be a variety of general type itself or they themselves or their compactification. I was wondering if you expect the same sort of behavior for your compactification of moduli space of stable variety of general type. Like if volume is large enough, do you expect them to be a variety of general type? Uh, it's quite possible. Yes, I mean, I cannot say for sure, but it's, it's quite possible, uh, especially if you just look at not pairs, but just varieties, and if the volume is very large. And yeah, maybe it's put some condition of the singularities, uh, but yeah, it's quite possible that what you get will be something of general type. And if the volume is small, maybe you get more complicated things. <coughs> Yes, so there are many interesting questions here uh, to ask. Uh, as I said, the first step was to show that there is a moduli space, otherwise, uh, what do you want to prove? Uh, but once we know that there is a moduli space, then it opens up many questions about studying these moduli spaces in more detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, seems there is one question in the chat box. No, uh, no, no. 
Yes, I cannot see the question. So if there is no more question or comment, maybe we I can... have I have a yes request please. or a question if possible. So as I can tell on, we have a bi-weekly algebraic geometry seminar. I was wondering if you would be interested if you would accept to give a talk at some point in our when I mean, this is more a specialized talk, so you could go into more details about your work. Because you really would like to see the details of this. You for, thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I think it would be nice at some point, but maybe not in the near future. Uh, maybe later. Okay, thank you very much. In a year or two. <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, and then and maybe this is the last question. Maybe you can see in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Where is the intersection of modular spaces and, and dynamic? Uh, okay. I, I personally haven't worked in this direction, but I think there are um, other people work in the direction of the dynamic, especially in the case of modular of curves. Uh, if you just Google, you just go on archive and, and search for dynamics and modular spaces. I think you can find so probably a lot of work. I, I know that some people, for example, at uh, Chinghua, I know some people work in this direction. Um, but the, the techniques and so on, they are quite different from what uh, we are doing in, in the bi-rational geometry world. But uh, yes, there is an intersection. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you again in the near future. Thank you very much, Coach. Okay, thank, you. thank you again, Javat and people uh, for, for organizing this seminar. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I should say that I, I admire people who work, continue to work under difficult situations. So don't give up, just continue as, best as you can okay you. so yeah good day to everyone you too bye-bye bye-bye